the human animal isn't doing well in the modern world. We have become domesticated and have lost our wildness. Rates of unhappiness are skyrocketing. We are anxious, fragmented, and drowning in an overwhelming sense of meaninglessness. It should be clear to all of us that for all the promises of modernity, we don't seem to be better off when it comes to our overall health. The Human Animal Show explores a return to a state of wild health, our original, authentic human animal. And now for your hosts, Frank Forensich and Dr. Rodney King. Hey, she is. Hey, Janine. Hi. How are you? Good, good, good. Well, thanks for joining me and Frank. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much for um, asking me. I feel really honored and it's uh, nice to uh, meet you, virtually meet both of you. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, no, we're excited to chat to you. So uh, you happy to just jump into it? Sure. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I I guess you know, my, my question for you is because, you know, you sent me over that information and I, and I did tell you anyway, that I was going to get your book because it sounds super intriguing, right up our, our alley, you know, everything we were talking about. And then you sent me that chapter and I read through it pretty, pretty cool. I loved it. Um, I kind of reading the chapter and I'm like yeah. nodding my head and going, yep. Yeah, that sounds right. I agree with that. You know what I mean? So I thought what would be really cool <laughs> is to kind of give people an idea of what this book is about, right? So just for context, your book is Returning the Self to Nature, Undoing Our Collective Narcissism and Healing. So if you had to summarize, what would you say that your position of your book is? Okay, all right. Um, Well, let's see. The Yeah, the book's really about um, looking at there's a whole meme and um, in like pop psychology around uh, narcissism right now where everyone's, um, you know, this person's a narcissist or using that term very liberally. And we even see it with uh, political leaders and um, stars and all sorts of folks who are just being so addicted to themselves. And I ended up studying uh, more of the clinical diagnosis of narcissism and particularly narcissistic personality disorder so and then I um was really and I know this is not a short sentence oh, sure. Go for <laughs> but it. really yeah really looking at how those patterns of narcissistic personality disorder are mirroring what we're seeing on a collective level particularly in western societies or any society that's really under a corporate global um, worldview, which unfortunately is more and more societies and how we're with our fierce individualism being accrued to uh, focus not only on individual competition and its success, but uh, we've diminished our ability to connect in compassion to others and in particularly to the earth. And so our patterns of collective narcissism are intricately related to the destruction that we're seeing of um, the Mother Earth, the planet, and our inability to uh, connect with nature and to see the destruction that we're causing and also really the destruction that's happening to us on a collective level. Mm -hmm. And so the book's about breaking that down going from, you know, what is narcissism? What's collective narcissism? How does this relate to the ecological crisis? And then what do we do about it? I think it's totally fascinating. I was just thinking when you were saying that, and and, and I'm, I'm guessing we're saying the same thing here. In short, I mean, I, a lot of people don't put these two things together. We mm-hmm. clearly see that the planet is traumatized. We've created that trauma in the way that we've behaved. 
but that also has a almost a, a mirror effect right as as the as the health of the planet declines i find it fascinating that the health of western civilization is declining too and a lot of people i think don't see that there is this connection between those you know because we we almost see for example what gets described as uh, when we talk about mental illness or mental health, as if it's some kind of separate thing that people are struggling with, but it has no deeper connection to what's actually happening mm -hmm. on a planetary level. And I think yeah. our trauma is just a reflection of the trauma in nature and nature's trauma is a reflection of ours. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And um, it was interesting because I've listened to the first two episode of your podcast, which is great, and also your former podcast. Um, but I was struck at towards the end of the last um, such, uh, um, podcast episode, both of you were talking about narcissism. So I said, oh, this is just um, um, such a great lead in to the conversation. And I believe both of you are um, familiar, and I, I think especially with Frank with eco psychology, and that's my uh, main area of uh, teaching. And I would say, I mean, I try not to be call myself an expert at anything. I'm a perpetual learner, but uh, probably the field that I'm most passionate about: eco psychology and transformative learning. And eco psychology is looking at exactly what you're talking about. It's saying that the um, disconnection of humans from nature um, is at the root of so much suffering that's going on in the world, both to the planet and to people. And uh, I work with four root assumptions of eco-psychology. And so the first one is that the earth is calling for healing. And, um, you know, you have to be pretty asleep not to notice that these days with um, all of the different storms and pollution and air quality and illnesses and uh, polluted waters and um, our massive consumerism, wildfires. And you know, I'm sure um, all of your listeners are um, pretty aware of what's going on with the ecological crisis and we could go on and on with that. But um, we're seeing so many species disappear, just, you know, so many, um, so much loss, so much suffering. And so really recognizing um, that the earth is calling for healing. And then the second assumption is that people are calling for healing. And often we don't um, recognize this collective trend. And so many of us are um, stuck in our kind of um, personal narratives and you know, um, mainstream psychology always focuses pretty much on your individual self. Like what's your, you know, what's your relationship with your dad or your mom or your partner and these things and not really looking at that. Um, so much of our collective um, pathologies are about the suffering that's going on. So we're seeing um, so many folks with uh, depression, apathy, um, all sorts of mental illnesses, health issues, addictions is a huge one from addictions to drugs and alcohol to technology, social media, games, um, television, to codependent relationships, to there's so many different forms of addictions. And then looking at how people have really lost the ability, especially with a pandemic. I've been reading a little bit more about this with some of um, you know the younger generations, but also all generations of, were so alienated from each other that we've lost some of our intra interpersonal skills, also our interpersonal skills of really being able to tap into what's going on with ourselves, to be embodied, um, to go into deeper questions, but also our ability to be um, compassionate and, and curious about others and to feel connected in community. So it, uh, you know, it's just such a deep loss and there's uh, just so much suffering in the world right now. It makes me get really teary. Mm. And then um, looking at how the suffering of the planet and the suffering of people are just so interconnected. 
And that's something that we have lost so much of our ability to track on because we're so disconnected from our homes, like our ecosystems, where our food comes from, the other beings that we cohabitate from, where our water's from, what's going on with the air, with all of these cycles and seasons. And we're um, stuck in these little cocoons. And so we don't realize that we're um, um, interconnected. Um, our bounds of what we might call self is um while we're real and we have egos and we're important, um, our boundaries of who we are extend much wider and we can't exist without these um, tangible kind of physical connections to earth, but also with these more transpersonal unseen connections with earth and, and, and more. Um, and then the fourth assumption in eco psychology, which I mentioned earlier, is that the sickness, this illness, is embedded in the history and practice of Western culture. And I always uh, um, expand that to anyone living in a globalized corporate world, which unfortunately now is um, almost, you know, the majority of people on Earth. Yeah, so eco psychology um, has been just such an incredible lens in my own awareness. And I actually stumbled on it in the 90s. I was doing a lot of work with multicultural education and um, more kind of diversity and social justice issues. And then I st was really interested in. Um, ecological issues as well and then I just kind of put the two together with lots of mentorship and readings but really looking at how um, the connection and, and um, the extraction of resources from the earth and the extraction of resources from um, people uh, particularly marginalized people go hand in hand and looking at how this is always part of a larger system that's embedded in any um, economic model that um, is dependent on having um, um, resources taken in order to produce profit. Mm. So there, I mean, there's a lot there, right? I guess for, <laughs> uh, I guess for a lot of people when I'm talking to them, mm. it's, there's this recognition that something is wrong. They know that there's something wrong. Deep down inside, they know that. Yeah. I guess for a lot of people, just the average person, just trying to make it through the day, right? Just trying to make it through the week, feeding their family, just keeping everything together. Mm. Well, where do they start, right? Because it seems so overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, where do we start? Is there, is there, I mean, I guess what we need to try to do, and this is what myself and Frank are trying to do as best as we can. And we get it that when we go this route, we may not answer everything, but can we, can we simplify this? Can we, can we give people maybe a simple process or a starting point that will help them start to turn this around at least for themselves? Because I think if we can just start making changes individually, each one of us, I mean, even though I'm on board with you about the narcissism, but maybe we can reverse yeah. that, right? And say, okay, if I can do something individually to, that will impact myself and the planet in a healthy way, and then we all start thinking that way, we may still have a chance to turn things around. Definitely. And, oh, that's such a um, big area. And it's also, I think, an incredibly, in some ways, joyful area because there's like no loss of um, things we can actually do to shift our um, practices and move towards healing. Uh, in the book, I have a whole um, kind of list of different things and um, break it down more. Um, maybe I'll uh, talk a little bit of, or a little bit or a lot about some of those. Sure. Um, yeah. And so I think a, a big thing for me, because, you know, so many, um, you know, systems or books or um, speakers um, have their like 
concretize like this is what you need to heal and if you follow these steps you'll be um, on the right path and I recognize that there's no um, set process for healing that it happens in a myriad of ways and um, everyone's path is different and so I don't um, purport to have um, all of the answers or even most of the answers uh, but I've um, noticed some patterns and traits associated with healing around this. And um, and I think they're accessible to everyone. You don't have to um, have a PhD or even a BA <laughs> to actually um, start doing these things. And, um, you know, a big one, which uh, uh, it doesn't have to be years of study or uh, but just really recognizing that there's some sort of problem going on. And I think most of us are in that um, camp, you know, even independent of what our political values are or social locations, we can recognize that whatever we're doing um, on earth is not working. There is so much suffering and we can um, kind of come to the sobering reality that, uh, you know, both individually and collectively, we're entrenched in systems that are not serving us. And uh, some of what we've talked about already, but um, seeing that all of this isn't um, just about our individual stories. And it's so easy to be locked into like, oh, I lost my job, or I have to work all the time, or I'm divorced, or my parents are ill, or um, you know, I've got um, sickness or, you know, whatever the narrative is, I think um, being able to wake up a bit and say, oh, my gosh, I'm noticing that these things are happening to pretty much everyone I know. Um, there is so much suffering in the world and there's also so much suffering on um with earth systems as well and it's affecting my well-being and all the beings that i care about mm. and so just really having some sort of um acknowledgement that there's a problem and um, i really appreciate a lot of uh, the recovery movements i'm um, sober and drug free and um, i know you know a big part of um, people who are in sobriety is really just admitting that there's some sort of problem. Yeah, I think that's then, I, think, I think that's a good point though, Janine. That's a really good point. Yeah. And talking about a starting point of being aware, right? So and yeah. if you're aware of something, there's nothing you can do about it. And I think for most people, because they're just trying to get through things, they're on autopilot and they're just literally just going through kind of a habitual process, right? And once you start becoming aware of it then it opens up dialogue, or at least it should. So yeah. you can at least say, well, I, I'm sensing this, I'm feeling these problems, I'm noticing this, and then somebody else that you're talking to goes, well, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the exact same thing. And then at least you can start having a conversation about, okay, but what have you been doing that you feel has actually helped you deal with the situation that you're in right now? And so that's where we can create that kinship, right? That kinship of actually starting to learn from each other where – I think a lot of times we just don't have those conversations anymore. Because what I notice a lot of times is yeah. that just being in the field that I'm in, and you know, I, I also come from an academic background, so I've done that stuff as well, is I've noticed that everything that tends to be put out in the modern world insofar as suggestions that you should do that will equal success, in actual fact, is just stuff to allow you to play within the system better, right? So it's not actually taking anything away from the system. It's not showing an alternative. Yeah. It's like those, you know, the seven steps to whatever, you know, like you were, you were sure. to earlier, these kind of like step by step, yeah. these seven steps and you'll be successful. Successful at what? Because when you look at it, it is, it's all the stuff we are saying that is the problem. What all these things yes. want you to do is be successful in the very things that's causing the trauma in the first place. So in yes. a way, what we have to do is we have to potentially unlearn. And I think, or at least 
reinvoke a story, an ancient story that's been forgotten, right? Because of course we can argue about, oh, if we go back to hunter-gatherer times, not everything was cool and great. <laughs> there are things about it that were kind of downright, you know, disastrous and mean and, you know, just wasn't a cool thing to do. But I think generally speaking, and maybe this is your perspective too, I know this is Frank's, is that mm. they lived at a time and in a place and with, with the planet in such a way that we have forgotten completely, right? You were in communion with, with Gaia, you know, you were part and parcel of it. And without that knowledge and understanding and that deep reverence and respect for the, the, the land that you stood on, you wouldn't last very long, right? Because there wasn't all these cool yeah. gadgets to keep you safe and everything. I'm kind of like, I always like make this joke with people. I say, could you imagine taking, you know, somebody like Zuckerberg, right? Mark Zuckerberg and <laughs> drop him in a jungle somewhere in Brazil. Um, you know, Facebook and all his technology is not going to help him there. How long would he actually survive? He'd probably be eliminated within the first 24 hours, if not sooner, right? And that's that's because, you know, it's this complete disconnection. But yet what these companies are saying that you need to do, as I keep saying over and over, is actually the very thing that perpetuates the system. And so we have to find a new way to show up, right? Yeah. Well, gosh. Oh, there's already so many things in what you just said that, yeah, I feel like, oh boy, we're gonna have to talk all day. Uh, but there's um, there's this book I read years ago uh, by an author, Herbert Cole. Um, and it's, uh, I won't, it's called, I won't learn from you and other thoughts on creative maladjustment. And it's essentially that, and he talks about like not learning theory, uh, but just really the importance of not, conforming to a system that is basically um, killing our spirits, our souls, our ability to live in well-being with earth and with one another. And um, I appreciate how um, I've seen you I'd name that you're an outlier from society. And um, I feel like there needs, there are so many of us that um, would probably identify in that way that we recognize that we're in systems that are so unhealthy and we're choosing to disrupt them and to choose a different pathway. And um, yeah, there's so much there in terms of just um, having those uh, firsthand experiences of being in nature. And uh, I, I personally, I love um um, while I talk about, um, you know, television addictions, but I love any like survival type show or that kind of thing. And I used to teach a lot of, um, um, uh, um, every year an eight day wilderness solo. And, um, there's something in that field where it says, you know, really civilization is only three days deep that if you spend, um, time in the wild, um, and, you know, that's a loaded term, uh, but if you don't have your smartphones and, you know, you can't open the beer uh, fridge and grab a beer or, your, you know, your chips or call someone or um, all the distractions, even sometimes, you know, books, um, if you can just be with what is and be embodied um so much of our kind of thinking layers and all of those kind of external um actors were often in our society constantly acting in a way that pre presents what in uh, eco psychology and deep ecology call uh, false self um and and that's also in you know regular psychology as well that we're actually making our personalities a, um, kind of a show for what we think others want us to be rather than finding our authentic selves and yeah Irvin, I appreciate um, yeah Irvin Goffman mm -hmm. talked about the front stage self mm -hmm. and the backstage self right so that's basically ah, it. Yeah. yeah that there's yeah, this yeah there's this front stage self that we put onto the world because we feel we have to play that that narrative in order to be accepted right and then there's this yeah. backstage self who we really are and I guess for myself is that one of the ways that I found is a kind of a a doorway into that back that backstage self 
is by mm. learning to be comfortable just with yourself, right? And that might mean for some people taking time out and having a moment of solitude, whatever that may be. And of course, the best place to experience that would be out in nature. You know, I think a, a lot of times, as you're saying, right, people are so concerned all the time about meeting the expectations of everybody else or what they think people expect them to be, that they never truly spend any real time just with themselves. And so they never truly know who they are. You know, so that's, I think, yeah. just being able to separate yourself out from that and just having moments of solitude wherever you can take them is a very powerful practice that I think is pretty accessible for most people. And I wouldn't say that you would have to do it in nature, although that would be the best option, but just being able to just do it when you can, I think is, is also a really good thing. Right. Well, if I could jump in, <laughs> I, um, I think one way, one starting point, one way to approach all of this is to think about identity and especially the word animal. Because this is something that uh, when I was a young man, I played with this idea and I thought, OK, well, I'm, I'm comfortable with that idea that, that I'm part of Homo sapiens. I'm an animal. I have this history. I don't have a problem with that. But then I went out in the world. And I found a lot of people have a big problem with that. And this is, I think, a, a theme in eco psychology where it's, you have this identity. If you're not an animal, then what are you? It's it's interesting. I have a friend who um, his name's Derek Jensen. He wrote a book called The Myth of Human. Oh Supremacy. yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah. his whole theme is that human supremacy. This this doctrine, this philosophy, this this arrogance of human supremacy is what's really at the root, what's killing the planet and making us comfortable because. Uh, we feel like we're separate and mm. we we don't define ourselves as animals and that might be the root of the problem sure that's i mean that's a good point you know and they're just like on that frank just while you're talking about it because i'm busy in the final stages of a master's by research where i'm focusing on eco psychology and my mm. focus is on actually what is the role of the guide in a nature um, therapy experience, right? Just call it nature therapy. Yeah. And that's also really important is having the, the, the guide to be able to take you through the experience. Because when I watch most people, when they say I'm going outdoors, what they're really doing is they're just moving from point A to point B and they, they still stuck within technology or they got their earphones on and everything. And the guide is, is that, is that again, is that opportunity to allow us as human animals to explore what it is to be within nature by giving us certain practices on the way so that we actually stop, take note, you know, not learn to not take ourselves so seriously, to see experiences that we have in life projected in nature itself. I mean, th this I find very like fascinating, and I'm sure Janine, you, you, you know about this too, but something that came out of my research, which I thought was really profound was that these guides were telling me that what they noticed was that people would come to an, a, an experience to go in nature. And oftentimes what the guides do is they don't, they don't set up an expectation. They don't say, Hey, why are you here? What do you want to get out of it? It's like, let's just go into nature. I'll give you certain cues. And, and then you just, you just take it from there. And as you noted, right, there's not just one step-by-step -step process. It's, it's different for everybody. And what many of the guides noticed was that, people that had suffered loss, maybe they'd lost somebody very close to them recently and they were struggling with that, with that loss, had come to this experience and they would gravitate towards parts of nature that potentially were on the out, from the outside, it looked like it was dying, right? Maybe a tree had fallen and, and stuff like that. And that would be the thing that would connect them. But what they also noticed was that there was this realization that even though the tree had fallen, it had created life in of itself, right? Is that by the tree falling, it created new life. And so there's that, that, there's that understanding of how nature mirrors our experiences and the realization that, yes, I've lost somebody that I profoundly loved, but out of that, there's also the potential for something beautiful to grow, right? And so this is why we also need people, guides, um, whatever you want to call them, the outliers who are giving people the opportunity to have these experiences. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, again, there's so much in um, what both of you just shared and um, maybe, yeah, uh, Frank, I just wanted to say, I love Derek Jensen's work and uh, his book, I think a a language older than words is just one of my favorite um, books. And I fully believe um, um, in that animal piece of just really being able to um, claim and remember that we're animals. I have a um, co-conspirator. She's actually um, this woman, uh, uh, Caroline Casey, and she often likes to um, open a talk with um, growling (laughs) or, (laughs) um, you know, howling like a wolf because often we're so subdued of being like, well, hello, how are you? Uh, And we can think about all like the cartoons or kids books with um, your bad art that has, you know, dogs and other animals dressed up as humans. And so, yeah, we really um, disidentified with this animal part of ourselves and even just like the, um, not getting outside, but even not inhabiting our bodies or um, being comfortable with the way we, um, our appearances, like the um, makeup and fashion and um, a lot of the wellness industries are constantly telling us that our bodies aren't good enough and we need to do all of these things and we should be um, afraid of like hair and like um, you know our biology and all of these different things and so when we lose that root of um, you know being bodies on the body of the earth and really um, feeling that um, um, mutual dependence or just dependence that we have um, and yeah the piece um, Rodney that you're talking about in terms of um, guiding people in nature and actually what you were talking about in the research of um, people with loss gravitating to, you know, dead, quote unquote, dead areas is actually something I'm not as familiar with, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah. But um, I think there's something so important in uh, having a guide to set some sort of expectations and really a lot of introductions to a particular place and um, what I love once we've established um, you know what people making sure people are prepared obviously is really important and some people shouldn't be going into like extreme wilderness immersions and maybe they should start with like having a plant and starting to like maybe take care of and talk to their plant or, you know, talking to a bird that's outside their home or those kind of things. And for folks that do um, want more um, guided um, excursions or, and it doesn't have to be an excursion, but I would say immersion, that piece of really knowing what you're getting into and why you're doing this, you know, the intention part, and also just the um, asking permission to be in a particular place, acknowledging the beings of a place, and then really um, starting um, in one space and just um, branching out little by little and doing lots of exercises that, um, start really developing all of our sensory awareness so like oh right i can um walk in the cold and the rain and i'm not gonna die from it i can um start seeing that there's um so many different colors of green or right outside my house right now yellow because the trees are um in full fall foliage and um learning who else is inhabiting that space there's and um, and yeah, and then at a certain point, what I love about um, those practices, whether it's wilderness therapy or eco psychology or ecotherapy or whatever we're calling it, um, at some point, nature definitely takes over. And I always make um, fun because often we're, um, you know, having encounters with different animals and wanting to see what that means for our um you know, like our totems or what is that? Um, And then I like to make jokes that, you know, the animals that we encounter are probably like, oh, look, um, I just met this human. I wonder what that means for us. That there's actually like this 
reciprocity and definitely what you're talking about in terms of that mirror with nature. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and, and, and I mean, you know, Frank can talk to this as well, like building off that is for people that maybe these ideas feel uncomfortable and I can see how it feels uncomfortable, especially when you've been urbanized, right. And you don't know anything else. <laughs> but you might have an inkling listening to this and go, I'd, I'd like to ex explore that. I'd like to experience that. I think that's where community is very important, right? Finding a group of people like-minded because what it does is it, it opens you up. It almost, you know, creates some courage to step outside of the box, so to speak. Right. And then you're more inclined to want to try these different things because you realize, hold on a second. I'm actually not crazy. There are other people that share this exact same perspective as I do. So I think, and that's, that speaks again back to our time as hunter-gatherers of being in bands and groups and communities and sharing experiences. And, you know, it would be very seldom that you would experience something in isolation, you know, and not connected to the tribe and the community. It was always a communal experience. And I think that's what gives it that, that profound meaning right it's not just it 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 separates you it, it it doesn't separate you it connects you right and so where the narcissism comes in is exactly as you noted is that everybody's in it for themselves but that's what they've also been told right they've been told that if you want to get anywhere in this world you've got to compete you've got to outdo the next person regardless of the consequences and hustle and achieve the accolades be it whatever, the awards, the materialistic gain, all these things, and you will come out the other side feeling fulfilled. That's what people are told. Mm -hmm. But actually, as we know, that isn't the case, right? It's, it's Again, it's all the things that are perpetuating the, the machine and the problems that we have. And so I think coming back to community is very important. And there are many communities out there. There are even, even smaller ones that are talking in the way that we're talking. And I don't think it's, especially with the way we are connected these days, I don't think it's that difficult for people to find those communities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I maybe bringing it, because um, you brought up narcissism, which obviously is a topic of great interest. Um, I think, naming too that um, people that have extreme narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder, and then we can translate that to like our common culture, they have um, damaged trust in the world. So, you know, there's so much um, stuff in psychology about um, people who have um, NPD really had um, broken relationships with their primary caregivers. So they have this distrust of other people. And so as a uh, means to um, compensate, they've created a fictitious reality that holds them at center. And so then they have to construct this whole worldview where everything's about themselves and all of their interactions mirror them being special. And so when we translate that to um, our collective society and um, kind of taking the step towards re-approaching being in community. Um, we see how um, in our current society, we can actually choose to spend time with people who just have the same values as us, often the same like social location, the same economic um, status. Uh, and so we're not really... Um, daring to have genuine community in a lot of ways because we want to just be with people that reflect um, our own values and so it's so important um, you know I always make the joke of because I'm that person you know when you go to like a potluck at work or something there's always that um, person that brings like the smelly tuna fish that you don't want to sit next to um, but like community is about actually being with those aspects of other people that are maybe annoying or don't reflect your um, likes or dislikes, maybe reflect back on you that um, some of your identities and beliefs may not be the right ones, you know, or that there's like a whole spectrum of um, difference, but how do we actually show up in a way that 
Um, we can have mutual compassion. And then also um, I have, it's actually in another um, book that I um, edited and um, um, also um, contributed chapters to, I have a um, chapter called the ties that bind um, an earth-based story of home and really looking at how um, in terms of community, we lost a lot of the ability, um, I'm losing my train of thought, um, of what, um, oh, of what the project of community is, because we no longer really actually have a task to accomplish often in community. So it's like you go to a workshop and everyone does their introductions, maybe like their pronouns and where they're from. And then you're supposed to be some tight knit group to go through some things, but then you all disperse and go back to your homes. Um, but, but then um, one thing that I um, appreciate is um with a lot of the climate emergencies that we're seeing, more communities are actually getting together around some of those issues, or um, there's uh, so much potential to reconnect in community, but so many of us treat our community members as disposable. Because mm -hmm. if you don't like uh, the person that, um, you know, you buy your baked goods from, you can just order them online or you can um, switch to someone. Like everyone's disposable. But when you realize that you have um, a project of community where your well being actually depends on maybe your neighbor's well being or other, um, it shifts everything. Mm. And so I think really finding those spaces, and I think part of it is also stepping out of our boundaries and going back into um, service and finding like, how can I be of service to others? So maybe I have a neighbor who's elderly that I could help with a few things or, um, you know, just there's just so many forms of help or just even being kind to people. Um, but we've really lost that art. Mm, it's true. Frank, you were going to say something. Oh, yes. Well, I think uh, what we're getting at here a little bit is this idea of a shared predicament. And when I look at, at human history and the fact that for 99 percent of our time on this planet, we've, we've existed in these hunter gatherer bands with a shared predicament, because if you live on the grassland, it's a predator rich environment. It's a dangerous place. Everybody is feeling the same shared predicament, the same sense of danger. And so it's obvious that you have to stick together and work together in, in a common effort. And that has disappeared with the industrial revolution because now we've lost our sense of, of shared predicament. And that, that may come back with our ecological crisis, but for now, everybody's this free radical and we feel like we can just you know ignore everybody else and that's that's historically abnormal that's um that's why i'm so interested in history because i, I think history tells you what is normal and what is abnormal history tells you what that native and indigenous worldviews have been normal for the vast majority of our history and they're normal because they work that is that is how we've survived. That's how we've lived, and we need that very much. There's a um, there's a poet and a writer, a Native American named uh, Sherman Alexi, and oh, yeah. he, he was giving a presentation at a bookstore one time, and he he was referring to his people, and he was talking to white people in the bookstore, and he was saying, "Look." you are going to need us. <laughs> and he was really true. I mean, that, that was right on the mark because we need native and indigenous worldview now. And we, uh, in large part, we aren't listening to that. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's a job for us. Yeah, it was just as you were saying that, Frank, I was like, I don't know why my head went to that. It's like, you know, a shared predicament, right? It's like, you know, those sci-fi movies where the aliens come down and they want to wipe us out. Then all of a sudden we can all come together behind a common goal, yeah, yeah, a common good, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and that's it. So I think there's something there as well. I, um, I guess for people listening to this, should they want to go out and explore these ideas and they going to go and connect with a community that they feel resonates with them and what they're looking for, then it 
would potentially be important, right? That that particular community has a specific goal, a specific intention. What is the intention of, of coming into this community? What are we are what are we focusing on wanting to achieve? Right. And you know, as somebody like from my end, because what I've also done for, for the last, you know, forever basically, I've also taught martial arts. And one of the things that I try to bring across to the students is that this person that's in front of you is not in competition to you. This You need this person to be able to achieve the goals that you want and vice versa. So actually you are co-teaching each other. And the way you treat this person is the way they're going to treat you and how you treat each other is going to then depend on how you're going to grow. And if you're just going to come in and you just want to eliminate everybody because you've got that narcissistic <laughs> mindset and you want to be at the top, you know, maybe you maybe you will be in a small little world, but you will never experience the fullness of what this experience could potentially be, right? So in, in my world, I would say, okay, so you learned how to fight, which is great. But at the end of the day, you learned mm -hmm. nothing else, right? It's like, I can go for a walk in nature, and it can just be a walk. Or I can go mm -hmm. walk in nature with an intention. And it can be a profoundly transformative experience. I think that's very important, right? So I think, you know, just coming back to the idea of community is if you're going to choose a community, they need to have a, a, a philosophy, a, an end goal. What are they trying to achieve? And I think that's that's very important because that's what binds that community together, right? And then you you know why you're actually doing what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. And oh gosh, again, so much um, in what both of you said. And again, another author. I do love Sherman Alexie's, uh, especially uh, his fiction work, uh, just amazing. And yeah, there's, I think, even going back to kind of the wilderness immersion pieces, like some of the beauty of that is remembering how vulnerable we are. And so much of the Western worldview has um, evolved at having these kind of um, resources so we don't have to be dependent on um, hunting for food and gathering and providing shelter that, you know, we can um, just, you know, buy a house, sign a lease, you know, go to the store, all of these things. So um, most of us don't really realize that um, fragility of life and, you know, not necessarily that we want to um, you know, just push people out into the wild with, you know, their, um, you know, their knife and their um, fire maker and say now, now, although that could be a great idea as well. Um, but there's something so important with that. And then, yeah, I mean, I can give an example of my, my own experience. I live in a um, small community outside in the outskirts of Boulder, Colorado, where um, in the, in the mountains between foothills between two canyons and we've had um, been disconnected through floods. And then we've also um, had fires in this area. And so we have a um, you know non-binding kind of neighborhood association, which was um, started just through fire mitigation. And how do we um, just actually come together as a community? And you know we have people from all different political um, spectrums, and and but we come together to do that work. And then we also have um, large predators. We've got lots of. Um, bears and also mountain lions and so um it's not uncommon to get a call from your neighbor that you know hey there's been this bear coming at night or different things so and you know most of us know each other's pets and where our spare keys are to get into the house because if there's suddenly a fire or some emergency um we've got you know messy but some sort of system and i think being um exposed to threats and elements, although that can be incredibly scary, it's really important. Um, and that's something that we have to actually um, give up um, our comfortable lifestyles. And then I was going to mention too, there's this um, scholar, author, um, his name's Sharif Abdullah, and he talks about these categories of um, keepers, um, 
breakers and menders. And so the keepers are exactly what Frankie were talking about, all of the indigenous um, cultures, earth-based cultures from time immemorial that have been really keepers of the earth and have such long-standing um, philosophical traditions and practices to maintain this balance. And then our cultures are the breakers, people who have like breaking our sacred bonds with nature and what one another and causing this like planetary destruction. And then I really appreciate the um, menders because that's exactly what we're doing. And, mm. you know, we're not going to just um, be able to step back into being keepers, especially, you know, population is, and, um, and growth is such a huge issue with the ecological crisis that everyone can't have, doesn't have access to um, wild na nature. And so many people actually live in urban areas and will actually have to live in urban areas with these high um, rates of population growth. Um, but there's something about mending and even mending urban areas. So we mm. reconnect with nature there and so and food production and all of those pieces so I, I think about that a lot too yeah i think there's a move towards that janine i mean if you think about biophilic design as an example i mean the recognition that having green spaces within a city is very powerful and important for a person's overall well-being we know that if you have green spaces in impoverished neighborhoods and i came from an impoverished neighborhood in south africa yes. and if you had green spaces uh, crime rates go down i mean we could go on and on and on right so very clearly it's an it's an integral part of who we are and it should be and it shouldn't be a surprise because as frank was saying and you were saying we lived within nature since time began this part that we call modern world is like a dot in the the ocean right it's like a blip on the radar it's it doesn't even you can't even hardly see it but we but because this is how we've grown up we think this is what it is right so we've been disconnected but once people have that reawakening and i do feel that there is something within us, um, the idea of biophilia, right? The idea of Wilson's idea of biophilia that actually deep down inside of us encoded deep within our genetic makeup is this connection mm -hmm. and draw to nature. And given the opportunities, we do see it. And so, like you said, we, we have to live in cities. We get that, but we can do it in such a way that it's still healthy for us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, when I'm, uh, but Frank, were you going to say something? Oh, just I'm, I'm thinking about actions people can take and the spirit behind their actions and living in this predicament, there seems to be a theme that's coming up in activist organizations around love mm -hmm. and rage. Those are like the two that they say our movement is powered by love and rage. And I love that because on one hand, you've got the biophilic connection with nature. You are loving nature. And now you feel it being taken away from you. And that's where the rage comes in. And trying to balance those two forces going forward, that's, I think, our challenge. And it's it's going to require some leadership and some fortitude to make that work but i i try and keep both those things alive in me so i can go yes. forward in a way that makes sense yeah and i mean that's i think so much of um the pathway to healing too um a lot of um folks and i'm particularly thinking of the work of joanna macy or pema children yeah. or miriam greenspan of just really um, being able to tap into our emotional selves. And that's, again, tapping into like what exactly you're talking about, becoming animal, becoming a human animal again, and how so many of us are really cut off from our emotions. And I've appreciated how in your podcast you talk about, particularly with um, men, um, that kind of cut off, but I think it's also... Um, to some extent, um, all of us, and we fear our emotions, we repress our emotions, and uh, we only want to have like the positive emotions. Okay. And so 
Yeah, really having that. And I think this relates so much to um, mindfulness practice as well. And I know both of you are um, really literate as practitioners and scholars with that, but of being able to sit with, you know, whether it's rage or sadness or even apathy, um, our own levels of suffering and let them to be teachers instead of like working so hard to make them go away. Um, And then equally so, I think we can immerse ourselves in so much stuff about um, our pathologies and the ecological crisis, yet so much of Um, the beauty of being a human animal is to experience joy. And I think our Western culture keeps, you know, teaching us to have these really high expectations for like joy and adventure. And so, so many of us are kind of like addicted to drama and adrenaline. Um, Yet, if we can get into those like simple joys, um, I mean, even just like the beauty of like, oh my God, I, I woke up this morning and I was able to take a breath or there's um, um, the sunrise is coming up or um, I mean, even like I can turn on the tap and water comes out of it. That's um, a pretty awesome gift. Like all of these simple things. And then um, I've been trying to maybe not as successful as my, um, (laughs) I think the pandemic really, um, kind of evaporated our ability for like laughter and jokes and I tend to be a really funny person but I've been like where has my sense of humor gone and it's really um I think that is like some of our the deep work of our time of how can we not take ourselves so seriously and um start to get back into those small interactions that bring um like these are the gifts you know you don't need a mercedes you don't need to own your own house you don't need a huge paycheck you don't have to have the um hottest abs or you know whatever it is you don't have to have a number one selling book um but you um do have to learn what um what causes joy and how you could accrue that how to serve others and also to stay with um so much of our um you know dark emotions, negative emotions. Um, and I was going to mention too, I'm sure both of you have read, I always have, I always have to mention it because it's all my, maybe my all time, one of my all time favorite books, but the book, um, My Name is Chalice and I'm in Recovery from Western <laughs> Civilization. Yeah. I was, right? I was going to ask you about Chalice. That's a brilliant yeah. book, yeah. That's oh a my gosh. I, yeah. I, I don't think I've written something in, um, over for yeah that everything cites that that my students are probably always like oh gosh she's gonna bring it up again but that um um primal matrix that she talks about which is like what is our um original state before we broke from our hunter-gatherer tradition before we stopped being earth-based peoples and she talks about those three um dimensions and that first is the um belonging and sense of security in the world. And it's not about having a fortress around you and being able to, you know, order products on, um, from an online source. It's about um, feeling at home, even in vulnerable conditions and um, really inhabiting body, inhabiting space, and yet developing that um, sense of trust and security. And then I love the, um, Second, I mean, I love all the dimensions, but the second one is having that unique um, um, purpose in life. And it it doesn't mean like um, having a career as a banker or teacher, you know, whatever, um, we're conditioned from externals to think we should be. But um, I love so many wisdom traditions say that we're born in this um in this realm, in this world with a gift to offer and also many gifts to receive. And it's our, um, the purpose of our community to help um, let that arise. And it doesn't necessarily translate into a big um, page check, but um, hope, and actually it could translate into some suffering too, but hopefully there's some joy mixed up in it. And then I love the 
um, final dimension, and they're not, eh, 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 you know, they're all integrated, but the non-ordinary states of awareness. And I, I think this is the one that we've lost so much in our society. And for me, these are the simple things of that make us say like, wow, like that's so amazing. And um, they can be such simple things. They can also be a rite of passage. They can be the dream world. Um, you don't have to take a bunch of drugs and have an outer body experience to experience them. Um, they can be creating art, um, but they um, tap us into like a more transpersonal state. And um, yeah, in the book, I um, write a bit about the concept of grace, which I think is so um, remiss in our society that so many of us were um, always have to be in control. And that's part of narcissists, narcissism of controlling our fixed reality because we can't allow other inputs um, because we're so um, insecure that we can't allow they are um, personality and what we think is true to crack because we'll just fall apart. Um, and so a lot of people that are extreme narcissists don't believe in something bigger than them. And, um, you know, I, I think we can call it, you know, God or goddess or Buddha or, um, you know, the matrix or, you know, you know, the force or whatever you want to use for it. Um, but that, recognizing that there is an intelligence in the world and beyond that is so much more intelligent than the human capacity. And when we drop into it, we suddenly have um, like these even bigger guides and allies that um, the way it works is like so nonlinear and amazing. And, um, you know, people talk about ancestors and all of these allies um, but so many of us are just even scared to go there because it's not only like, woo, woo, but it's just, we lose our agency. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, talking about your book, Janine, when is it actually coming out? Yeah, it comes out um, on November 1st. It's uh, available for pre-order, but it's uh, just, just about out. I have, um, I have a copy here, which is kind nice. of cool. And the, um, yeah, so it is, um, people can order it and, uh, yeah, I, um, it's so funny to have a book coming out that is so much about narcissism and it's been written for a while with the pandemic, um, producing books has been such a longer time frame. So I've been kind of like, oh, well, I'm ready to do something different now. Um, and then it's so kind of a little embarrassing to be promoting books a book that's about narcissism and not to feel like a narcissist. So, yeah, but my intention yeah. so deeply is that it does affect um, people and for them to re-examine their um, relationship with self and society and especially with nature and earth and for some changes to come about. Well, definitely timely. I think uh, I think it's going to be well received. I'm looking forward to reading it myself. And uh, yeah, we we're coming up to to the hour here. So, any last okay. words of wisdom, Janine? Oh gosh, Lunar. Um, yeah, I think I've just been um, yeah, just the importance of kindness. Um, all of this can get really heady and we can be really judgmental about ourselves and other people and society and corporations and all of that. And um, I think so much of the work right now is not to create enemies, whether it's with our own identities or leaders or those time, types of things, but to really go back to this um, concept in ego psychology that everyone's suffering. Um, someone may appear to be at the top and maybe they're at the top of the economic level. But if we knew their full story, we'd actually probably see stories of suffering. Um, and so, and recognizing that for all of these shifts, um, we pretty much need everyone. Um, we're not going to make 
the major shifts of society if there's um, if we don't have the majority of folks on board. Um, and so, um, yeah, I can, um, I, you know, I teared up in the beginning and so I'll try not to tear up now, but when um, I think about people coming together in unusual couplings, like um, bridging um, social identities, like race and gender and politics and religion, and just can recognize our, um, you know, in Buddhism, we talk about basic goodness and um, that we're actually a human and a body on a shared earth and to just have some kindness and compassion to one another, it really opens up um, a doorway um, and a liminal space that can be so very healing. Absolutely. Totally agree. Fantastic way to end. Thank you, Janine. Really appreciate your time. <laughs> and, uh, Good luck with the book, and uh, I'll once I've read it, I'll let you know what what I thought. Oh, thank you, and thank you both for the work that you're doing. I'm definitely I'll be listening to your um, future episodes, and uh, yeah, I've checked a couple. I'm like I'm ready for episode three. Hopefully, it's coming out really soon. This, this and week, I've this just, week. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I honor the work that you're doing, and I hope we. Uh, can uh, stay in uh, connection and network. absolutely, absolutely, yeah, love yeah. to. Yeah, right. yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Janine. We'll let okay. you go. Yeah. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs> cool. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. She's great. So Very I think sorry. I think like the takeaway for me there, and that's kind of what I've been thinking a lot about is the the path to simplifying, right? It's like, because we talked about a lot of things in that hour, you know, that you could see that there's a lot of, I guess, a sense of complex complexity and nuances and trying to get it across always, isn't always easy. But I think what Janine was saying at the end, which I thought was very important, was trying to simplify things, trying to find, right. find a simple process that right. allows for what we're talking about to reawaken the human animal. And I think the problem that I see is that society has overcomplicated everything. And when mm -hmm. it's not overcomplicating things, it's putting things in silos, right? And so <laughs> they're not connected. So it's kind of a weird paradox. It's like everything's so complex, but everything is siloed. And, yeah, and I guess yeah. for each of us, what we have to do is we have to try to find what works for us but to simplify it like like kind of a minimalistic kind of approach not just to your environment yeah. like the minimalism right, right. that's so popular right but minimalism as in what's happening inside yeah. here you know yeah yeah do this do this do this and that gives people a pathway um, yeah 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 i like that um, i'm sure as we as we continue to talk to guests we'll 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 come to some kind of Res resolution on what should be done at least as a starting point right like simple yeah, well, it, it sounds to me like you're looking for to give people a prescription or a, a map or a guidebook um and that that makes sense yeah, yeah i guess i guess what i want to do and where i'm thinking is okay can, can we find these simple perennial practices that mm -hmm. are formative that build a foundation and then should you want to go off and explore other avenues they come out of that foundation you know so not necessarily a definitive prescription saying okay follow these steps and that leads to whatever you know right, it's like, right. well this is like a starting point on things that you need to address first right and right. once you start working on those elements of yourself then you can then direct that energy into different avenues, but you at least drawing from a foundation, right? Like so if I think about it just personally and I had to just break it down, I would say that, okay, well, one is we have to uh, consider the way that we think, right? Our thinking mind is a big part of our experience. And is there a way to simplify that, to basically bring it down to its bare minimum so that it doesn't trip us up in life, right? Then we have our you know, interoceptive states, the way that we feel in situations. Are we able to reorient them or recalibrate them so that they become 
in service to what we want to achieve and not become detrimental, right? So if I'm running in that fight and flight mode all the time, that's going to give me a very narrow view of potentiality. If I can be more in a calm, centered, focused state internally, that's going to open me up to a wider kind of perspective and more opportunities, right? So that's just two examples, right? So I would think like, that's like the foundation, like that's the things we need to get right. And then once we have that, then we open ourselves to other things that we may want to explore that would be different for each individual, depending on where they are, time, place, culture, you know, ability and so forth, right? Like like Janine was saying, right? You know, yes, it would be great for people to go into the wilderness, but don't just, you know, if you've never been there, you don't know what it is and you don't want to just throw somebody into the wild, right? I mean, think yeah. about, like I keep saying, think about Mark Zuckerberg. He wouldn't last 24 hours. So, you know, but 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 I think we, we all have these kind of um, formative things that trip us up and all of that's happening internally, right? From how we're thinking, how we're feeling, our emotions and so forth. And if we can find a way to orient them in a way that they're in service and not taking away from our experience, our potential, then we are actually in a good place. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Hey, Dr. King here. Thank you for joining myself and Frank on an exploration in improving the health of the human animal. To find out more about our work, you can visit frank at exuberantanimal.com. For coaching with me and to find out more about the Human Animal Project, as well as our retreats, go to humananimal.info. Until the next time, be wild, be free.